So tonight, we're so thrilled to have Chuck and Belinda with us. I'm going to simply, everyone knows them, but I'm going to read their bios anyways, because it's always interesting to hear little tidbits about them you might not have known. Belinda grew up in New Harbor, attended Bristol schools, and is proud to have ancestors among the early settlers of Bristol. She's a graduate of Bates College with a degree in history, holds an MA in Latin from Boston College, and did additional graduate study in classics and Roman history at the University of North Carolina. For many years, she worked as an adjunct professor of classics, most recently at the University of Southern Maine, until, very sadly, the university discontinued her department. <laughs> I was so upset when Lincoln Academy canceled Latin, oh. and my daughter had just entered Lincoln Academy, but she never <laughs> had Latin anyway. So Belinda used to run Harborside Cottages in New Harbor and currently resides in New Harbor and Cumberland. And Chuck Rand, Chuck grew up in Damascata, graduated from Lincoln Academy, holds a BA in Anthropology and Archaeology, an MA in History and Historical Archaeology, both from the University of Maine at Orono. And he has a master's degree in library science with a focus on archives administration from the University of Maryland. For many summers during the 1970s and early 1980s, he was an archaeologist at Colonial Pemberley. Chuck has worked for the Maine Historical Society, the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City, the Political Commercial Archive at the University of Oklahoma, and the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. Chuck recently retired from being the archivist at the Sabbath Day Lake Shaker Village in New York. So we're very <coughs> grateful to have you both here. Thank you very much. Let's give a warm up. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, hopefully everybody will be able to hear me. We're not mic tonight, but I do tend to speak kind of loudly. Um, if any of you have been to our presentations before our archival uh, photo shows, you'll know how excited I get. <laughs> um, the archives, uh, the photo archives are really um, a project that Chuck and I began and um, in 2015. And Today, if you were at the meeting, you'd hear we have over 3,000 images now in our digital image archive. So we couldn't be more pleased with how it's, how it's going and continue to, and continue to grow. Um, if you're not familiar, I'm going to jump right in. My, my computer says I have 109 slides tonight. So here, here we go. <laughs> Um, if you're not familiar with our archive, I'm just briefly going to introduce you to it um, because you can, uh, if you enjoy our show tonight, you can on a rainy day sit in your own living room if you have internet and go online and see all these images and 3,000 more. Um, so I just want to let you know how to access it. First, you have to go to our website. If you can't remember oldbristolhistoricalsociety.org, just Google us, and you will find, uh, you'll find us pretty easily. We have a website. We have a Facebook page. We also have a YouTube page with uh, presentations like, like the one I'm giving tonight. Uh, once you get to our home page, oh, I've got my, my little thing. Once you get to our home page, um, you'll see the menu up here. Um, uh, sidebar, resources is very interesting. There's a lot of links there that you can read things. But what we're interested in tonight actually are collections. So just click on collections and then you will come to our collections page and uh, digital images archive online now. You want to click on search our digital images archive. And then you'll come to a new page that has a new menu. This is not the same menu that you saw before. This is just our database. It has a variety of ways to check, uh, to, to search our archive. Uh, Chuck has made all kinds of search terms. And I mean, he's created a, 
a veritable uh, card catalog that shows my age. <laughs> but uh, a, a great way is of searching. Um, and this doesn't show the full page. There are tips for searching also on that page. Um, one way, if you're a little intimidated by searching, just click on, whoops, just click on random images. And you will come up with pages and pages of random images from, from our archives that you can just, uh, just go through. And if you see something that interests you, just click on it. So this was what came up when I was making these slides. Uh, this is my grandparents, but I won't show you them. Um, I saw this, Little Brown Church member. I think it's supposed to be members. But I thought that looked kind of interesting. So I clicked on that, and I came up with a record. Um, over here, there's um, three images you can click on, and they'll come up bigger. But there's also a whole um, uh, catalog record. So you know, it will tell you things like um, what it was, if it's a snapshot or a negative or a postcard. Um, it will tell you who the photographer is. It will tell you all kinds of things. There may be a description. And so in this particular photograph, um, the, the members were identified. So you can read there who was identified. And um, if you scroll down on that same page, um, this is also on that page. And you can see there are individuals here. You can click on each one of them. Chuck has done genealogical research as well. So if you see someone in there you think you might be related to, you can click on one of them. Um, another thing that's interesting are the search terms. So say you got interested in this photo, like the Little Brown Church, wanted to see other things, just, just click on one of these things and you'll get more, more images and more records um, from, from the archive. And there's also subject headings as well. Um, so you could also um, go to the keyword search and put something in that you're interested in. Of course, this is a computer. If you just don't get it right, it will say we don't have anything. That doesn't mean we don't have anything. It means maybe try another term. Um, and just one tip here is if it's more than one word, make sure you put uh, quotation marks around it. That keeps the words together as opposed to showing everything that says island. <laughs> and everything that says louds. Um, and you will come up with a whole um, 85 results found. OK, so there's 85 results found. You can go through that and see if there's anything that interests you. Wait, oh, so um, tonight we're looking at collections. If, um, if one of the collections that, we're, that you're seeing tonight interests you, you could actually go back and look at everything in that collection. And one way of doing that, uh, again, this is just a keyword search. Um, we're, we're showing four collections tonight. Uh, Melvin and Matthew Fountain Collection, uh, Lorraine Morong, uh, Carol Jean Rotner, and Kendall and Carla Fawcett. So I just typed in Kendall and Carla up here. And you'll see there are 865 <laughs> items that uh, Kendall and Carla have loaned to us and have been scanned. So if you want to go through Kendall's postcard collection, there you are. <laughs> and again, you can click on each one and find out things about, about it. OK, now on, on to the show. <laughs> um, tonight, I'm, um, if you read the description of tonight's talk, I'm going to showcase four collections that have come to us within the last two years. And we haven't done a presentation, I think, for two years. Or is it three? three? I, I don't know how that works. But um, we've gotten so much material. And uh, some of these collections are just, they're just wonderful. And I apologize in advance a little bit, at least to the people that are here that maybe donated these collections. Each of these collections should have a whole evening probably more than one evening. So I am just giving you a little taste of each of these collections to show you what, what, what's in them. So um, this is the Fountain Collection. And um, 
I'm happy to say that the donor is here tonight. Uh, Matthew Fountain is there. There he is. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, I'm not a personal friend of his. I don't know him. But you know what? He called up the society and said, we have all these materials in the house here. Is this anything the OBHS would be interested in? And it's like, yes, yes. <laughs> so that's how these things come to us. Um, so I grew up here. I never knew a single fountain. Um, it just wasn't a name that was current in Bristol. And so I'm like, OK, fount fountains. And then we got this collection. And I also started looking in the Bible of Bristol statistics here. There's pages of fountains. Um, and um, this particular collection has 265 photos in it of, um, that are, that's taken around the fountain farm. And just to get you oriented, here, here's Bristol Mills, and here's Round Pond. And the lower Round Pond Road goes right between uh, Bristol Mills and Round Pond. Um, the fountain farm is right here. And note that little road that goes out around there. <laughs> That's the fountain farm. And then up here is Sproul Hill Road. Um, and if you are. And that's Boyd's Pond. Uh, yes, and, and Boyd's Pond is, is right here. Um, so, as I said, I didn't know any fountains, but when I started looking at, into their family, the fountains are related to the sprouls, are related to the crooks. I, I, I don't even know how many people they're related to, so I'm probably related to them <laughs> as, as well. So even though the fountain name isn't here, they have a lot of descendants still in the area. So I just, wanted, I just wanted to say that. This is a picture of the Fountain Farm today. So when you're going on the lower Round Pond Road, you can see it's a beautiful farm. Um, the fountains do still own it. They come in the summers. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they come in the summers. It's a beautiful farm. And here we go. Here, let's see. I don't know if I'm, all right, let's see. So this is the how it looked at around 1920. Um, it looks pretty much the same. Uh, there aren't many trees around. And I, I pointed out the road uh, because in the old days, the road came right down between the house and the farm. So that's what that little, there's no road on, on that map. There's no road there. But it's the remains of the old road that went between the house and the barn. Um, this is a view from the Fountain Farm over to Boyd's Pond. And I don't even know if you can see Boyd's Pond <laughs> from the hill now. In certain um, areas, you, you can still. Yeah. And it's all grown up. It's all grown up. And I thought that was quite beautiful. There's a, there's a stone wall down here. And um, there were orchards. I, we'll have some other views. This is um, around 1900. This is Edgar Fountain. Uh, he was born in 1835 and lived to 1911. He was one of eight children um, that, were, that were born here. Um, the, as far as my research goes, and I'm not an expert on any of these pictures, but I try to do a little bit of research. Um, the first fountain to come to Bristol was Barnabas Fountain. Um, and he came in the 1700s and settled on Louds Island. Um, and, um, and there were lots, as I said, there were lots of fountains in the area. So um, Edgar Fountain is Barnabas Fountain's great, great grandson. So born in 1835, his great, great grandfather was in the area um, before then. Um, but the earliest pictures we have, at least in, in the, this batch of pictures, is um, Edgar. That's the first fountain that we have photos of. And he had, um, he had a large family himself. Um, I think he had five, five children. Um, anyway, here's a picture. Uh, some of these are quite early. This one, the 1900, this is around 1904. 
and Inez, his daughter Inez, is in the doorway. Um, Edgar's got the barrel of flour. That is a barrel of flour, because we could zoom in and read the, um, the writing on the barrel. And his wife, Mary, is sitting in the doorway. And uh, oh, the wonderful thing about this is a lot of names are written on these photographs. So um, we can identify them. Lizzie Crook is in the doorway. And I don't know who the baby is, but um, it was an active, active group. <laughs> This is also a very early picture. Um, it, it's, we've dated it around 1890, because um, Edgar's in the doorway there. He doesn't look like he's on his deathbed at all. <laughs> Looks like he's got about 20 more good years in him. Um, so there's another family picture. I don't know if those are L wives or just freshwater fish. But they're out of Boyd's Pond. Out of Boyd's Pond, yeah. yeah. And of course, you've got to keep up the farm. <laughs> uh, we, this is around eight, uh, 1925. And there's Laundry Day. Um, this is around 1925, too. A lot of these are around 1925. This is also identified as Josephine Sproul. Do we know who the photographer is? I was just wondering that, too. Those we don't really know. Um, th uh, and the, I did want to say this, too. I'm glad you reminded me of that. It's wonderful because these are snapshots, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, not a lot of families took snapshots. There were a lot of portrait studios, I mean, studio portraits. Um, but um, it's great to have, to have snapshots. And here's the ladies getting uh, some water from the well, and they're identified as Lilla J, Lizzie, Loretta, and Margie, getting water from a well. <laughs> and, and Matthew, was that well still there? Was yes. that well covered, that granite block? Yeah. yeah. Wow. <clears throat> Another thing that's really wonderful about this collection um, is that it is of, of Bristol Mills area, um, and of, far, of the farming industry, farming, because we have a lot of photos of the shore and of the fishermen and, you know, the sea, harbor scenes. And so this is really just a wonderful collection of, um, of farming activities. And Bristol had a lot of farming activities. I mean, inland from the coast, it was all farming here in Bristol Mills. More haying, and I do have a close-up of this because I just love the children. <laughs> when my children were little, they took a they took a field trip up to um, oh, what's the farm? It, there's a farm in northern Maine where they take kids on field trips, and they had to dress up. And it was like he had a straw hat on, and and, and that's what I. Norland's farm. Yes, yes, exactly. And I have pictures of him dressed up, but doesn't look quite as authentic. <laughs> um, this is Fred Yates Fountain. He was one of Edgar's children. And he is the, <laughs> I can't quite get it now, great-grandfather of Matthew? Great Matthew's great-grandfather. Um, you can see he's holding a, holding a pot, a, a, a feed pot feed the, the, uh, the sheep. And also, this is from the Fountain Farm, and this is Sproul Hill area over there. Um, and we'll get a couple shots of closer up there. But you can see how open the, the land was um, at that time. It's just beautiful. And also, I keep noticing all the stone walls in here. They're just, just beautiful. So here, this is a lovely photo. This is um, up on the hill, in, uh, up beside and in back of the Fountain Farm. And you can see the, the farm itself. Look at those beautiful stone walls right there. Uh, you can see Boyd's Pond up here. And then I just love this view over to Sproul Hill, over there. <coughs> Then we go down to the river. There's a lot of going back and forth between Fountain Farm and Sproul Hill. Um, 
So here, here's a view um, of the river. Uh, we don't have a date on it, but. Um, this is Hatchtown Bridge. This is Hatchtown Bridge, yeah, yeah. And I. I that Hatchtown Mill would have been operating. Yes, that's that right in there. Yes, we have some old pictures of that when it was no longer operating, but that that may have been operating at, I, I assume it would be, I don't know when it stopped operating, because this could be 1825. Yeah, so it probably was still operating. Yeah, we had more than just the Pemmickwood Mill back then. <laughs> we had a lot of mills. Again, snapshots, you know, I just love the snapshots. A, a formal portrait's one thing, but a snapshot is another, and they just look so perfect. Um, this is Helen Sproul on the, on the left, so, and on the right is Maurice Fountain, who is Matthew's grandfather. grandfather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, love the bikes, love the expressions on the face. This is taken uh, on Sproul Hill. And here's a, a close-up. This, this is a close-up from a further back photo, but this is, this is Sproul Hill, uh, what they call it Hatchtown Farm, yeah, yeah. Uh, because it married into the hatches. Um, I think I've got a, oh, well, Helen Sproul, let me see where we go. Yeah, H Helen Sproul married James Hatch. Um, so a lot of connections there. I don't know if you can recognize these buildings. I think most of them are all still there. Yeah. The hip, hip roof building is there, the home. I don't know who these homes belong to. Other people could actually. Is that the child's house? Child's, 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 yeah. Not the hip roof. Yes, the hip roof one. Oh, okay. Is it the other one, Delmas? Oh, I think so, yeah. It's Delma Sproul's house. Who's on the lower farm? Is Carol here? No, Carol's not that, here that today. That barn is now, I think, apartments. Condos. Condos, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Let's see what I got. And here, here's another view coming around the corner. <laughs> And here, here's another great, great photo. This is um, a, an early photo, it's around 1900, and it's Isaac Sproul. And Isaac Sproul was the husband of Katie Sproul, uh, Katie Fountain. So there, there's another uh, marriage connection there. Um, Katie was Edgar's, Edgar's daughter. Um, and this was a blacksmith shop. And the note says it's later Helen Colbath's house. <laughs> so um, Isaac died at age 63 in 1925. So this is, this is quite a bit earlier than that. And this is, this is my last photo from the Fountain Collection. And uh, written on it, it's around 1920, just written on it was, going home after dinner. <laughs> so they're going from Sproul Hill back over to the Fountain Farm. <laughs> so there, there, are, there are a lot more, a lot more photos in the Fountain Collection. And um, as I say, they're, they're just lovely. Um, now I'm going to move on to some highlights from the Lorraine Morong co collection. This is not a photo from her collection, by the way. This is a Jack Lane photograph, aerial photograph. And I put it up here just in case we have visitors who aren't familiar with Louds Island. But um, the harbor here is Round Pond Harbor. And if you look out from Round Pond, you see the big island there. And that is um, Louds Island. And um, uh, it's kind of an interesting story how Louds Island got its name, if you, if you didn't know that story. Um, it, it's also called Muscungus Island, which I believe was an Indian name or derived from an Indian name. 
uh, but it became Loud's Island in the 1700s. Um, so early in the 1600s, earlier than that, um, Indians lived out there, and then there were early settlers there in the 1600s. But in 1689, you may know Pemaquid was burned to the ground and was abandoned until the Dunbar settlers came back. Um, Louds Island, uh, Muscungus Island, was abandoned at that time as well. Um, and it wasn't inhabited again until uh, the mid-1700s. And uh, William Loud is how the island got its name. He was uh, born in America, I think around Portsmouth or Kittery, somewhere there. And he joined the, na uh, joined the Navy, which of course was the British Navy then. Um, and he apparently <laughs> was quite a character and didn't like obeying orders. So he didn't obey orders and he got imprisoned in the brig of the ship. And uh, with a little help from his friends, he escaped from the brig and stowed away in another ship that was heading down east. Um, he made himself known eventually, couldn't stow away forever, and the captain was friendly. And the captain suggested that he might like to settle on this abandoned island, because um, there was an old house there that hadn't been, you know, that had been abandoned in 1689. So he got out and he settled there, and that began the resettlement of, of the island, uh, Loud's Island. So we have a lot of characters <laughs> up, here in, up here in Maine. <laughs> Let's see. So um, I just wanted to say what is really special about the Lorraine Morong collection. She um, summered on Loud's Island for many, many years, and she became uh, fascinated with the history of Loud's Island, and she became the sort of the official archivist of Loud's Island, and she collected as much history and stories, photographs, archival items, uh, it uh, objects that she found in the ground. She, she really gathered quite a collection of, of items. Um, she passed away, I think, two years ago now, um, but before she did, she was pleased to be able to hand her collection over to a place that would keep it and preserve it. And we're very happy that it was the old Bristol Historical Society. Uh, and there are a lot of treasures here. Um, we have catalogs. So if you search Lorraine Moran collection, um, you'll find 40 archival records. But those, some of those records are like 100 pages long. <laughs> and um, Chuck did not scan the photo albums as individual photos. So some of those archival records are photo albums that you can just go through and see. It's, it's really wonderful. All right, let's get on to the photos here. Um, I know nothing about this photo uh, except for the caption. It says, Captain James L Ellsworth's Indian Weir late 1800s or early 1900s. Um, and I do have a close-up of that. Um, I get, maybe, Bobby, you could say it's an early form of fishing that we well, don't just see. Just off the east, northeast side of Louds Island is Indian Island right there. And the Ellsworth family goes way back to, you know, er, very early 1900s. And this is weir fishing along the coast of Maine. You set weirs in, you put brush up there, a school of mackerel, whatever, will come along and go in there. At low tide, you just pick up the fish <coughs> off of the ground or just get it with, you know, nets of some sort. Mm. Uh, this is labeled the Crick, 1930s. I take it that's the har harbor at Loudville? That's or? the harbor on the east side, which comes way up into an estuary there. And it all drains out, just as you're seeing it there. There were two, three very large wharves. There were three stores on Louds Island. The ferry from Boston used to stop at Louds Island, not Round Pond. They stopped at Louds Island and sold all their wares there. And the people from Round <coughs> Pond would come out to Louds Island to buy their supplies. It was too hard to drive a horse and wagon up to Damascata. It was much easier to go by boat out to Louds Island. Hmm. So here's a little close-up of some of those uh, fish houses. There was a hotel up there too, wasn't there? Small hotel, yeah. yeah. 
There was a, a church, a one-room schoolhouse, dance hall, three stores. Uh, the school had at one point about 49 kids in it, one-room schoolhouse. So. And we'll see some photos of that. <laughs> um, again, I, I only know what I can see from what is written on these photos. Um, it's, it's labeled that this is Robert Carter. Um, so Robert Carter was born on Loudsville in 1844. And he, he was an active fisherman for a very, very long time. <laughs> it said uh, in 1916, he was deemed the oldest active fisherman on the main <laughs> coast. Um, and um, well, I don't know if this is a happy or a sad ending, but he died doing what he loved. Um, in 1916, he was found um, floating, oh, and his boat was capsized. It was believed that he suffered a shock while he was fishing. Oh, I did a close-up. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, another picture of the fish houses, and uh, again, this is labeled. It says that the fish house in the center um, was used by Levi Carter and Nathan Carter. And Nathan Carter was one of the owners of uh, one of the stores on the island. And it's uh, said that when he unloaded his goods, he would unload them here and then cart them up to the, cart them up to the uh, store. Could I just share one story? No. Oh. No. <laughs> maybe. Maybe you can. <laughs> I'll give you a chance if I don't tell it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Nathan Carter was uh, the owner of one of the, one of the stores on the island. Um, this is a photo of his house, a barbershop, and the post office there as well. Um, and the store burned, unfortunately, around 1926. And I wanted to show you a, a closer up of Nathan Carter there uh, with a sled going on. Because, um, whoops, let me find my, yeah. Um, Lorraine would, would record some things. And uh, here's one of the things uh, that is also in the archive. It's a little story about Nathan Carter. So, um, well, just a little background. Nathan Carter brought up on the island, and he had his uh, a first wife, and then his wife passed away, married his second wife in 1912. Um, and that's a little bit of the background. She was not an islander, but she came to live on the island with him. Um, this is, these, this is in the words of Lorraine. There are stories and stories about people who lived and worked on Muscungus Island, but I don't have proof of many of them, so I've not recorded them. But one story I will record is that Kenneth Gifford told me about Nathan and Mame Carter. It relates to when Ken was in his teens. He was born in 1911. And the reason for the Carters moving to the mainland, that's what the story's about. Ken reported that his understanding was that Mame Carter told Nate she didn't want to stay on the island any longer. Nate's reply was that as long as he had a house there, he intended to stay on the island. Well, one Saturday evening, the Carter house was found on fire. So all the able-bodied men on the island hurried to put the fire out, and they were successful. Well. The next Saturday night, the Carter house was on fire again. <laughs> and the men put the fire out. But on the third Saturday that Mamie set fire to that house, the men let it burn down. And Nate and Mamie went to live on the mainland, <laughs> according to Kenneth Gifford. <laughs> Okay, Bobby mentioned the schoolhouse. Here is, here is a picture of the one-room schoolhouse uh, that was on Louds. Um, uh, uh, 
according to my notes uh, in Lorraine's uh, archive, uh, there was a, a first schoolhouse built of stone and then a schoolhouse built of brick. And finally, a wooden schoolhouse was built around 1870. Um, eventually, it was upgraded by the state, so it became an official school under the main state law. Um, and it operated until 1962. Um, and um, somewhere in these notes, it says, you know, when, once the school closed, that's when a lot of the families had to move off the island because it was just too hard to raise young children on the island anymore. So that's when the, the transition be began between year-round residents and people summering on the island. Um, unfortunately, the school building burned um, in 1999. But it looks exactly like that because the owner had pictures of it and had it rebuilt exactly with oh. two doors, one for boys, one for girls, okay. and set it up just like the original school. Oh, good. Yeah. I, di I didn't know that. 1907. Class of, uh, class of 1907. And you can see how many children there are there in the school and, and the names. Polans, Louds, Carters. Bensons, Osiers, um, uh, names that, that were on Louds for a long time, and in Bremen and in Bristol. So, And here is just a close-up of, of that to see the children's faces. Um, I, don't, I don't know who commented on this, but there's, there's only one kid who's got a little smile. <laughs> <laughs> He's got plans. Yeah. Um, this is from 1955. So this is um, um, getting, getting on in time. Um, but there were still enough students to keep the, the school going. And these people are identified, too. So again, if you have relatives out there, search the, the collection, because you will find things that are, that are labeled with names. That teacher was there for four years. Um, I like this picture. This is Elmer Osier, Dennis Osier, and Arthur Poland. And um, I like this photo because in previous uh, talks, we've shown pictures uh, that have to do with Elmer Osier. Elmer obviously grew up on the island, and um, family was from the island. But when Elmer uh, grew into adulthood, decided he wanted to move to New Harbor, and uh, so did his father. So they moved to New Harbor, and of course the way they moved was they picked up their houses and floated them over to New Harbor. <laughs> and I have to tell you, there's someone here tonight who lives in Elma Osier's house, and that's his grandson, Don Osier, who's right there. Yeah. <laughs> and Don shared these wonderful photos of the houses floating in the harbor. Um, and so. it's actually more than likely that it was Elmer's wife, Helen, that decided to move <laughs> <laughs> She had something in common with Mame Carter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, um, here's a dedication service. Look at this. This is a, a pamphlet uh, that's in the collection. of The, the church was built, um, I guess, 1913, um, dedicated in 1914. And there is an interesting story about, about the church. Um, I don't know if you know the history of Malaga Island in Maine off of Freeport. It's a, a very unfortunate story in Maine's history. It was an island um, sort of off of Freeport. Uh, New Meadows River. New Meadows River. Yeah, off of Winnegans. OK. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> It, it was inhabited by um, blacks and people of mixed race. Um, and it, it was a very vibrant community of fishermen. And they had school there. And, um, and in the early 1900s, the state decided they didn't want them living there anymore. Um, and you know, there were all kinds of reasons. They said you know, conditions were bad. They, you know, they came up with reasons, but they forced them all to leave. They, they made them abandon their homes, and they tore down houses. And um, what does this have to do with Louds Island? 
Uh, the schoolhouse on Malaga Island was obtained by a church group, and the church group moved it to Louds Island. So this, the schoolhouse from Malaga came to Louds, and timbers from that building were used to build the church. Here's a picture. We've got uh, Cecil Pryor, um, the Reverend Prigmore. It's Prigmore, not Prigmore, but I guess he was out there for a long, a long time. He shows up in a lot of pictures. The church was served by the Maine Seacoast Mission from Bar Harbor in Northeast Harbor. And it was they who built, actually, the schoolhouse on Malaga. Ah. So that they, they knew about that. In 1913, the people of Loud said, we need a church. So the Seacoast Mission said, we know where there's a building that has been vacated. And so the, they took the schooner Abdon Keene over to Malaga Island, took the building down, and rebuilt it not into a schoolhouse, but the church, as you see it, mm. 1914. Mm. So. Mm. The church still there, The church is just like it is, just like that. We just had in 1914 100th anniversary of the building of the church. So, um, so I think some people here recognize who this is. This is Cecil Pryor. Um, he, he, uh, Cecil was a local fisherman. He was a farmer. He grew up on Louds Island. Um, and for uh, 30 years, he was the mail deliverer, uh, the mail carrier to Louds Island. Um, he was born in 1915, and he just passed away in 2010, which is why I say a lot of people probably may still remember Cecil. He was a character. Um, so yeah, he, he delivered the mail for three decades. He began by rowing uh, from Louds into Round Pond. On a good day, it might take 25 minutes. On a on more challenging day, it might take an hour or two. <laughs> and um, I saw in one article that um, occasionally the harbor would be frozen over. And so he'd row into Moxie Cove and then have to trudge three miles up to Round Pond <laughs> to get the mail and make the trip back to, back to Louds. Could I also say mm -hmm. that twice he walked to get the mail. He walked across Muskonga Sound with a dory in between, the two men with a dory in between them and walked over to get the mail and brought it back a number of times that way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's always the stories of the families that get me. So I kind of got into this through Cecil because of, um, of people people's reminiscences of him. But then I, the Morong collection has all these wonderful um, photos. And one of the documents is a photo album that belonged to the prior family. So there's a lot of nice uh, photos documenting the, the family. This was Cecil's father, Thomas uh, Pryor, um, who was born in 1864 and passed away in 1945. And that's his wife. Uh, Letty Pryor. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting. When you grow up on an island, it's a pretty small community. And, you know, it's not always that easy to find a wife or a husband. <laughs> um, so, um, Thomas Pryor, I guess they called him Cal, um, you know, he wasn't married for a long time. He lived on the island. Um, his parents still lived on the island. Uh, but when he was 40 years old, he kind of lucked out um, because a young school teacher came to the island uh, named Letty Moore. She was from Ellsworth Falls and was assigned to the Muscungus Island School. She was 20 years old, and uh, she happened to board at, at Cal Pryor's mother's house. Uh, maybe he was living there as well. I, I don't know. Um, and they got married. So this is a picture of their family. Um, you can see there's quite a big age difference there between Cal and Letty, but it was a happy marriage by all accounts. And they had five children. Um, I've got it written here. Um, children, front row. Tom, 
at the here, and there's Cecil. Cecil was the youngest of this family. And then he had three sisters, um, Lois, Dora, and Leah. And then uh, the, his grandmother also lived with the family. And this was, this was Thomas's mother, a lot of good genes in that, in that family. Um, Elvira, Simmons, Pryor, Hofsis. So she ended up having another husband um, after um, Thomas's father passed away. This is a picture of the Pryor farm out there. Uh, there's a, there, there were interviews with Cecil Pryor. Um, I don't know if Pete Hope did one of them. Yes. Um, uh, they were in the Lincoln County News, and of course clippings of all that are in the Morong collection, so that's how I happened to come upon them. Uh, he said, uh, Cecil said it was a you know, small farm, seven or eight milk cows, a horse, hens, pigs, and a really good garden. They grew everything. And of course he, he helped with the family garden. There's another, another view of it. Um, that, that, this is actually the water over here. There, there was another photo that showed looking up from the water, but that's what you call a saltwater farm. <laughs> Here's a picture of his mom. Letty Pryor taught for like 20 years at the, she said she came to the island and never left, you know. So she, she was the um, school teacher. She taught all of her children, <laughs> she, or she had all of her children in her class. Um, and then she became the postmistress there for 15 years. So um, here's a picture of Cecil and his wife, Elizabeth, and they had one son, John. So, you know, Cecil's, Cecil grew up there, and again, it's kind of hard to find a wife. <laughs> um, well, Cecil, um, Cecil's older sister, remember he was the youngest in the family, his oldest sister was a school teacher, and she um, took a job on, and I don't know how to pronounce this, Cryhaven or Creehaven? Creehaven, uh, which is an island about 20 miles offshore. And she married a fellow out there. And um, uh, one summer in June, she came back to Louds to visit. And she brought her sister-in-law, her young sister-in-law, uh, Elizabeth. And, uh, they visited in June, and in September, she and Cecil got married. <laughs> and uh, so Cecil said it was hard to find a, a, a wife who would want to live on an island. And this is a quote from one of his interviews. Well, she was used to living 20 miles offshore, so she was glad to get a mile away. <laughs> and this is three generations. Cal, Cecil, and his son, John. And then there's a, a number of pictures in here of John Pryor growing up on the island. So Cecil um, brought his, his son up on the island. A lot of, lot of nice pictures of him playing on the farm or with his grandmother. There's another one, the wood pile. I don't know if he's working or playing, but. <laughs> and. Uh, here he is in the schoolhouse. Um, so um, John, John Pryor graduated from, so if you went to school on Louds Island, it, it wasn't all that usual that they would go off, that they would go off to attend high school, at least in the early, early days. And then, and, you know, and then they started sending kids off. Um, Cecil's sister, went to Kent's Hill, I think, or one of those schools, a boarding school away. Cecil himself went off island and lived with one of his older sisters in Newcastle and graduated from Lincoln Academy. So that was pretty neat. But um, in, in 1961, I saw a newspaper, a, a newspaper clipping that John Pryor had graduated from uh, Bristol High School in 1961. And the, the, the article was like, um, the first Loudville boys, there was another one, Stephen Carter, to graduate uh, from Louds Island to graduate from high school. So, and the, and the, 
no, not the first one, sorry, the first one since 1934 when Cecil graduated from high school. So Cecil had graduated from high school and then there'd been no more boys that had graduated from high school that came from Louds until John and Stephen Carter. And one final, one final photo, this is Cecil and uh, he's carving. I just had, cause I zoomed in on this and you know, he's carving a stick and I just, I remember my grandfather doing that. Everybody always had a stick and was carving something. Um, but the other interesting thing I thought was the, was the dock there. Um, you know, the piles of stone and the, the way it's constructed. Looks a little rickety on top. <laughs> Okay, um, are you all doing okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I told you I always get super ambitious with these shows. Um, so we're gonna move on to the Carol Jean Rotner collection. And um, there, there are some wonderful photos in this collection, particularly of her ancestors who are faucets. So everybody's related to a faucet. Um, but what the really interesting thing about the materials that Carol, uh, that Jean has lent us are all the archival records. And we're talking, uh, well, you'll see some of them, ledger books, letters, insurance policies. Um, there's all kinds of wonderful things. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go. But um, so, I don't know if you know where Jean Rotner lives. She lives right across the, from the mill, um, just, just, off the, just off the picture here. Um, but her family's home was the Fawcett home, which is the first home as you turn onto Harrington Road. And this is a view from the front porch of the Fawcett home. Um, and luckily, it, it's one of our, our earliest photos of the mill. And you can see the mill pond. I actually do a close up here. Uh, you can see the mill pond and the mill. Uh, there's no retail store there yet. Um, so I think that's a pretty neat picture, as well as the church up there. What's the date on that picture? Uh, circa 1920. Yeah. So that road is Harrington Road? That, that road is that's Route 130. Uh, and then, uh, so as you're going towards Damascata, uh, you go past the mill on your left, the first left, is the Harrington Road, goes out by the town landing and up to Pemaquid Harbor. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> when you turn onto, Har uh, onto Harrington Road in Pemaquid Falls, this is the first house you will see. Um, and there it is around, um, actually this is dated very early, around 1895. Uh, this was the homestead of, of Richard Fawcett which was Jean Rotner's. Jean is about 90 now? Um, yeah, 89. 89. Uh, this was her grandparents' house. And there's a close-up, all the people on the front porch. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the Fawcett, uh, Richard Fawcett's children. Um, and this is, uh, I'll show you this one. Uh, this is Jean Rotner's mother right here, Carolyn Fawcett. Um, we've got, if you're related to any of these people, Mary Fawcett, Carolyn, Mildred, um, and then the four boys, Mac, Lloyd, Stan, and Jasper. And there's quite a range in, in ages, as you can see, from Jasper to the youngest. This is around 1920. Uh, this is Redmond's Hall. If I don't know, is that still labeled Redmond's Hall? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the Pocahontas name is there, too. Oh. Uh, I think it's in the building. Okay. And then um, this is looking up Harrington Road, and you can see the McKinley Schoolhouse. Our old, old Bristol Historical Society home is right here. That was a one-room schoolhouse. Um, and uh, other houses going up there. Their homestead would have been just off, off the view here. But these are little Fawcett kids here, a little close up. <laughs> That's Jean's mother here again, and younger sister Mary. She wasn't quite sure, but which two brothers that might be. 
Anyway, so I, I was mentioning that one of the great things about this collection are all the archival things. This is a page from a 1941, eight, oh, sorry, yes, 1841 ledger um, that uh, owned by Oakman Ford. Um, Oakman Ford was one of the early owners of the Pemaquid Mill. Um, and uh, Gene Rotner owns the house that belonged to the Ford family. So I don't think she's related to the Ford family, but she bought the house and all these materials were left in the house. So, you know, that's a real, real treasure trove. Um, so, Oakman Ford, I, I can't go into the whole history of the mill because there's, there's a whole story there. Oakman Ford, um, well, Oakman Ford had 12 children, um, seven with his first wife, Abitha Bean. Um, they lived in Sullivan, and then they moved to Bristol Mills. So he had seven children with her. His wife died, and then he married Sarah Jane Ford, I mean, Sarah Jane Miller, sorry, Sarah Jane Miller, and uh, Sarah's Jane Miller's father was the original owner of the mill, so he kind of came in as a son-in-law, and that's how Oakman Ford uh, came into the mill business. Let's see. Uh, not all 12 children lived to adulthood. I, I, I think four died before they reached adulthood, two as infants, two in their teens. So um, because we have the mill, there's been a lot of attention on William Ford, because there was, Oak, well, there was Sarah Miller and her father, and then there was Oakman Ford who owned the mill, and then his son, William Ford, owned the mill. And so the, the mill was actually in the Ford family from the early 1800s till 1911, I think, when it was sold out of the Ford family. Um, and so there's been a lot of attention on William Ford, who's pictured here, um, and we know a lot about him. He's mentioned a lot in the Pemaquid Messenger. And, you know, he was quite a character. Uh, the mill was not a big going concern. It was just one of the things he did. He also had horses. He also farmed. Um, very active, active guy. And uh, uh, there'll be more about William Ford as we go on. But um, as I said, the Oakman Ford had, had, well, eight children who lived into adulthood. And some of the, this archival collection shows us some of the other Fords, which I think is, is very interesting as well. This is his daughter, um, Frances Ellen Ford Hill. Uh, she's William's sister, half-sister, actually. Um, and this is around 1870. And, um, and then back to this picture, the other one was taken from this, but I, but I wanted to show it because this is another sister. This is Bessie Ford. And um, she never married. Um, she always lived with, with her brother. And uh, well, this is his wife here. Um, Nellie Perkins married William Ford, but this is Bessie Ford. And um, I wanted to show you something. There's all these mysteries in all this archival stuff. Um, so Bessie, she never married. But we found this letter that was kind of, kind of a, a little mysterious. Um, so this is a letter to Bessie from Robert Dolliver. And uh, Robert Dolliver, um, let's see, he, he, he was a widower, and then he married his second wife um, on April 9th, 1895, April 9th. 1895, and here we have this letter addressed to Bessie on April 28th, 1895. And here's what the letter says. You can make of this what you will. <laughs> Miss Ford, dear madam, yours of the 25th came to my hand last eve. It's a letter. I really hadn't thought about your last being unanswered uh, till reminded by yours just received. Um, I, too, had in mind what you informed me was in yours, the destruction of our letters. 
I burned yours, as you will tell me you have burned mine. Which is better, which is the better way, as we both think. I trust you are well. I haven't heard from my brother and wife directly since I left Revere. I hope to be able to go there sometime during the coming summer. I trust they are well and shall write them soon as I can get around to it from my flurry of business. May happiness also be yours through life. I am very respectfully Robert H. Dolliver. <laughs> She didn't burn all his letters. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, another brother, this is, this is fascinating too. This is, um, this is William's younger brother, John, John Ford. And um, I have some things to say about him too. Um, John Ford enlisted in the Union Army when he was 21 years old. Um, and he enlisted in the 20th Maine Regiment, Company E, which had people from Bristol, Newcastle, local, local area. Uh, they took the train from Portland to Boston, um, and then the 20th Maine sailed from Boston to Alexandria, Virginia. Um, so that's in the fall. And then um, it became unseasonably cold that fall, and well, as happened to many of these regiments and companies when they, when they first enlisted, s sickness swept through, uh, swept through the companies and through the regiments, um, mostly measles and typhoid. Um, but we have, we found a whole, s a, a series of letters, well, there's lots of letters between the Fords, but there were these three letters that, that came up that, um, were just fascinating. Um, so apparently that fall, John fell ill. And um, he was sent to a hospital in Alexandria, Virginia. And we have three letters that he wrote from the hospital. Um, and I'm just, I'll leave that up here. But I have some, some things to read. And I, it is getting late. So I'll try to, I'll try to not read them in full. But um, uh, this is the first letter dated December 4th. I received your letter from you this forenoon of the 1st and was glad to hear that you were all well. I wrote you one yesterday and stated to you that I was going to stop here in the hospital. I do not know how long. Um, I am on guard duty now. Only, only have to stand four hours out of a day and all night if the doctor thought I was not able to go to my regiment. I do not know, but I may stay here all winter. I'm getting along fairly well, only my lungs are very weak. I'm going to write to the regiment this afternoon and have my mail sent here. I've not heard any word from there yet, and so I do not know how much mail I've got there. Um, I saw, okay, I saw by the paper yesterday where 300 of our brigade were taken prisoner but none of our regiment, and I saw where our old acting Brigadier Colonel Stockton had his sword broken by General Hooker and dismissed from the service, and he just done the honest thing. They are clearing out the hospitals here, for they are expecting a great battle. And I mention that because the battle they were expecting was the Battle of Fredericksburg. Uh, which took place, this is December 4th, well, this is December 20th, but this letter is December 4th. The Battle of Fredericksburg took place December 12th through the 15th. So the hospital was preparing for this battle. Um, every day, they order, the order came to have 23 more hospitals open and in readiness of the wounded. Um, then there's some more. I'm not going to read that. But... Um, the next letter that we have is December 20th. So this is after the Battle of Fredericksburg. Dear, dear brother, I received your letter today of the 26th and was glad to hear that you was all well. I'm getting along about in the same old way. We have quite a hard sight here now. We got about 50 yesterday wounded persons and I can tell you it is a hard sight. The poor fellers are wounded, bad, mostly in the legs. 
There is 10 or a dozen from the 16th Maine. I helped dress their wounds. They got cut up bad. They went into the field with 500 men and only came out with 150 sound men. Um, I see that a few of our regimen got wounded, but none of our company as I could learn. Um, and I think I'll stop there. And, um, and then finally, there, there's another letter from the 26th. That's, that's this one. And uh, just to wrap up his, his story here. Dear brother, I now sit down to write you a few lines to let you know that I'm going to leave the hospital this afternoon for convalescent camp. They've returned 15 or 20 for duty, and my name is with them, not because I've not done my duty or anything of that kind, for I have got the good will and praise of everyone here and have not got a black mark of any kind since I have been here. But you know the rule is as soon as they think anyone is fit for duty, it is the duty of the medical officers to send them. So I am willing to go and hope I shall not have to stop at the convalescent a great while, for I want to get to my regimen. So give yourself no uneasiness about me. My health is good, and I hope I shall stand it. You need not write any more letters here, nor nowhere else, until you hear from me again. Tell mother not to worry about me. I will try and look out for myself a little better than I did before. I will write you as often as I can. Tell Eben and Peter not to write any more here. Love to all, and ever remain your true soldier brother. John Ford. So um, to wrap up John Ford's story, um, you, know, you know the battles the 20th Maine was in. John Ford, he never really recovered from his illness. Um, he, he was returned to duty. So this is, you know, January. He was returned to duty, but on April 1st, 1863, he's listed as a casualty again, um, absent due to sickness. Um, I checked the, the, the names of the 20th Maine that fought at Gettysburg, and his name is not among them. Um, that's July, in July, 63. And then um, by... Fe uh, February 4th of the following year, he was mustered out of, of the Army a year and a half early. Um, it's a three-year term. He was mustered out a year and a half early, uh, and it was listed due to disability sickness. So I, I, there was no record of him having been wounded, but there was a lot of records of him being sick. But... <laughs> there is another, the, the end of John Ford's story is that uh, he got out, he, you know, he got out of the Civil War unscathed, and he went west, go west, young man. So he went to California to find his fame and fortune. He became a grocer and uh, lived his adult life in California at Vallejo. Um, he died in California, um, and there's lots of letters of him back home. Um, and there's kind of a dandy picture of him. It was taken in San Francisco. The back is San Francisco. So um, he ended up having a happy life. This photo was also in the Ford collection. And um, it's William B. Perkins. Now, William Ford's wife was a Perkins. So I don't know the relationship. It might be her nephew. I take it it's her nephew. Um, you have to look very closely at his face because he enlisted in the army when he was 16 years old. So even though he's got that beard, his face is very young. Um, and his, his, his experience in the army was a lot different from his cousin John's. Um, he, he mustered in June 15, 1861. On July 1st, 1862, so the following summer, he was captured and he was imprisoned in uh, Malvern Hill, Virginia by the Confederacy. He was eventually released and went back to duty. On July 2nd, 1863, 
so the summer after that, he fought at the Battle of Gettysburg and was wounded. He recovered from his wounds and was returned to duty. The following May, May 23rd, 1864, he died in battle at the Battle of North Anna River, Virginia, at the age of 19. Okay, one last, one last Ford thing. And again, check this out. There's all these letters. It's, oh, you think these letters are hard to read. I have to tell you, Gene Rotner made a transcription of them. So if you go here, in fact, I just printed out her transcription. She, pr she printed them out. You know, there, there are little mistakes in there, here and there, but you will understand why, because it's very hard to read this script. And if you, when there's little things that you can't read, you can actually go to the, to the, to the letter and see if you can make it out. <laughs> um, I have to, again, I have to read this letter because this is another brother. This is Eben Ford. And he's an older brother of William Ford. He went to sea. Um, he, was a, he was a mariner. And um, he, uh, he sailed all over. And uh, during the period of this letter, he's out in San Francisco. He's out in the Pacific, off of, off of uh, well, off of San Francisco. Um, and he writes this letter home, and it is a treasure. I know I'm going too long. If you have to leave, leave. <laughs> but it's so interesting. Um, so this is uh, November 20th at sea. Well, you can read that. At sea, November 20th, um, 1868. And there's a bunch of, uh, he writes this over a series of, of days. Dear sister, as I have a fair wind today, I thought I would try and write a few lines so as to have a letter ready to send you when I arrived. I've been out five days and have had very bad weather until today. For the next three months, we look for very bad weather up in this part of the country. There's not much comfort to be taken here in the winter but the summer is very pleasant. I have a very good vessel at present, have got first-rate accommodations, and when I get her fixed up a little more, will be very comfortable. But still, I do not take much comfort. I worry and fret too much. I do not like the country, but as I can do better here than anywhere else, I suppose I must be contented for a while. If you were all out here, I should like it better. But I like old Pemaquid the best. <laughs> no, uh, another new entry, November 21st. Well, sister, I have not had a fair wind today, but it is a beautiful day, a weather breeder, I suspect. I suspect you're beginning to have cold weather down there now. Well, all you want is plenty of food and good wood and not go outdoors in bad weather. That is the way I would do if I was down there. When I get home, I shall get a wife and stick to her as long as there is a mouthful in the house. <laughs> that, is about, uh, that is about the way cousin Sam and wife does. A happy life, that. Don't you think so? Since I've been away this time, they've had quite a heavy earthquake, according to reports. I suspect San Francisco got shook up pretty well. This, uh, this was actually the earthquake um, of, uh, well, of 1868. Um, it was a 6.8 on the Richter scale. And before, you, you're probably aware of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake that destroyed everything. Before that was the great San Francisco earthquake. And this is, the, this is that one, the Haywood Fault earthquake. But he has a lot to say about this. Um, so uh, I suspect that San Francisco got shook up pretty well. I should not wonder then that it would sink some one of these days, for the city is all made, is all made land, a very poor foundation for large buildings. And it is a very wicked city, plenty bad enough to sink. <laughs> <laughs> the most of the folks have no respect for Sunday. Sunday is the biggest holiday they have for riding, gambling, and gunning. You can go see all kinds of life on that day if you like. 
I have seen a little of I have seen a little of it, but very little, for I do not believe in it. I was not brought up so. November 25th. As I've not written any for four days, I will try and scribble a little today. We've had all kinds of weather since I wrote last. Plenty of wind and rain and sea, and it is blowing strong today and thick weather. But as it is, but it is a favorable wind. Um, you cannot walk about today without holding on. I have to keep well braced while I am writing. I'm about 250 miles from San Francisco. With good luck, I shall get in the 27th, but it may be 10 days. I, I feel very anxious to get in. I want to, I want to hear from home and see the folks when I was there last. Um, I sent, I, when I was there last, that is San Francisco, I sent $250 to William. I hope it all went safe. I am in, ho I am in hopes to get home one of these days and build a little shanty on my piece of land and keep a bachelor hall. Won't I be handy to the fish? All I want is a cow and six hens and a rooster, a dog and a cat. I've got a dog and a cat and two pigs on board here. <laughs> My cat is as playful as yours used to be. A great deal of company for me and she had good care taken of her, you can bet. By the way, I've got to go and see a widow when I get in. She is one of my owner's daughters, and I hear she wants to marry. Her mother and me are great friends. They say she is very homely, but then she is worth considerable money, and her folks are too. <laughs> that may make her look better. <laughs> but... Yeah, but, but I guess I won't get any wife till I get home. I like the down easters. But do you think there is anyone that would have me down there? How is Josie these days? Susan Myers would make a good one for a poor man. What do you think of her? There is plenty of good ones down there. <laughs> I, I expect, though, the most trouble is with myself. Don't you, don't you, uh, don't you think? Okay, December the 3rd, 6 o'clock in the morning, and I, suspect, um, and I suspect while I am writing, you're taking your morning nap. I cannot sleep in the morning, and I am raring to get in. It's been a week since I wrote any um, before, and I've got about 130 miles further ahead. I could go to San Francisco in 10 hours if I had a good wind. It is calm now and rainy, but uh, I'm in hopes of getting a fair wind today. It was early this morning when I commenced to write in rainy, but it's cleared up, but no wind. I am 90 miles from San Francisco in sight of the land of Little River where Maisie Boyd lives. I should like to go up and see her. If I get a chance, I shall. <laughs> it is a nice place to go. And then uh, the next entry isn't from Eben at all. It's, it's just... Um, Sunday, December 13th. Dear sister, as Eben is all ready for sea and will leave in about two hours, he wanted me to finish this letter as he's not got time, so I'll write you a few words. I am well and stopping ashore here in San Francisco. This is John, Brother John. I'm not going up this time. Eben sends four $50 orders this time. 150 in his name and 50 in Lee Solomon's name. This is all I can write this time from your long brother, John H. Ford. But isn't that just a treasure? Oh, he did get married. Seven, <laughs> seven years later, at some point, he came home and he married Amanda Blunt here in Pemaquid. <laughs> Okay, um, last collection, um, and there's some great, great photos here, so we can just go through these. Um, Kendall and Carla Fawcett, again, I think I said 873 postcards in this collection, and you can find them all online on our website. Um, this is the new town hall, 1913. And here's uh, uh, Bristol Mills. That house has always been close to the road. <laughs> Still is. And here's a little close up. Of course, love the sidewalks. Um, wooden sidewalks everywhere. And this is looking up the Benner Road. 
and wooden sidewalks even up the Benner Road. That, that's the parsonage right there. And that's the parsonage right there. So I tried to pick out photos I hadn't really seen before. This is the 1914 Bristol Agricultural Fair. And um, you can see there's a, a little racetrack there, um, a big crowd. Um, the first, uh, I got this information from an article that Gladys Lewis had written back in the 60s. She was also like Bristol history and tried to share a lot. So I haven't confirmed all this, but I got this from the article. Um, the Agricultural Society formed in 1870, and the first fair was held at that time. It was uh, held uh, right here, right down here, right by the town hall. Um, and at the first fair, they invited the governor to speak. And the governor was Joshua Chamberlain, and the subject of his lecture was the surrender of General Lee. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, uh, Eventually, it outgrew this area. They moved up the hill where the old Grange Hall is. And um, it was a school holiday when, the, when they held the fair, contests running, all kinds of games, all kinds of things. Um, eventually, they even bought a merry-go-round to increase the profits. Um, so I just did this close up to see the barrels. So that's why I know it's a racetrack, a race around the barrels. And here's the merry-go-round. <laughs> um, this is 1915, but there's the merry-go-round. I take it this is some kind of a, uh, it's hooked up there to provide some power. And here's a little close-up of the merry-go-round. Here's basketball game at the 1914. I was disappointed to see they weren't baskets. They had nets back then. And uh, what did she say? It was, in a, it was in an article. Someone who rem in 1968 could remember the games. She said that the Beach Boys were good at the races and the Round Palm Boys always won the wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you can just see the little competition between the villages, because we're not really one town. We're villages. <laughs> uh, we'll move over to Round Pond, and there's always these beautiful shots of the wooden sidewalks going up the main street. And then uh, here's postcard. Uh, around uh, Now, the postage mark on the back, it was a postcard, there's writing on the back, is 1906. And it says, this is the view we have from the hotel. So um, this is a, a great piece that uh, commemorates the beginnings of tourism in the area in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And there's... Uh, down, down at the shore, the docks there. Sometime I have to find out what all those buildings were for. <laughs> Is that, that crane for the quarry? Uh, it, very well, yeah. it very well could be, sure. yep. This is also a postmark 1906. So that's a view over to North Shore. It's so bare. Mm -hmm. And there's a close up there. <clears throat> I hadn't seen a photo like this of Bat Cove. This is Bat Cove and the little bridge across wow. there. And I'd never seen it with um, under, underpinnings there. Usually it, it's open. So I'm thinking this is, this is quite old when, when it actually was a working lobster pound. Yeah. I mean, that was. And there's a site we don't see much now, this seining. Uh, this is right at the head of the harbor, New Harbor. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Small Brothers. <laughs> a lot of us remember this. This is 1965, but I just wanted to put that in there. <laughs> and one of, uh, one of New Harbor. This is 1954. I was noticing the Natalie B. Uh, that's got to be Cordy Brackett's yeah. ship, uh, Monhegan Island. And um, again, again, this is another picture about tourism in Maine, really. Uh, as you know, my parents ran... Harborside Cottages. This is 1954 because they're building their third cottage. And then over the barn there, the barn's no longer there, but um, the barn was supposedly being turned into a hotel, which never materialized. But my dad always told me he was building a, he was, he was uh, making, turning his barn into a hotel. And he put that big dormer up there, but I don't think it ever was. That's the Maycomb place. Yes, yes. The house is still there, but not the barn. There's a picture of your old house, Bobby. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is the Route 32. Yeah. This is the old uh, Methodist parsonage. Yeah. And beside it is um, the Little House, which was a store. Um, the Littles ran, a, ran a, a, a dry goods store there. And Old Bristol Historical Society has the ledger desk, the desk that came from that store. And then down to the beach, Pemmickwood Tavern. I was always fascinated with that because I always knew it was called the Pemmickwood Tavern, but not much was going on there <laughs> when I was growing up. It's like, what's the story of this place? I love this picture, all the cars down at the old Fort Cabin. It's around 1935. <laughs> and then we get down to, to the point, and we, we really are almost here to the end of the evening. There's an early picture of the Bradley Inn around 1925. I believe Cora Martin would have been running it at that time. Here's another one I'm fascinated by, the Sunset House. It was a large hotel down in back of the Bradley Inn. Um, it, um, it, it started by a Burnside in the late 1800s. In uh, 1901, it was bought by Cora Martin, who ran the Bradley Inn, and it was operated as an annex to the, to the Bradley Inn. Um, it almost burned down in 1933. Uh, there was a newspaper article about a fire started there, but it was salvaged. But um, it did eventually burn down in 1956. Okay, here's our last little, little spiel here. Um, this is a postcard. This is the landing down at, at Pemmickwood Point. Uh, right in back of the dock is Kresge Point, if you've, if you've been down there. Um, right at the very end, the Pemmickwood Hotel uh, built a boat landing so that tourists could, uh, could be brought to Pemmickwood Point. Um, I'm doing a project on the Pemmickwood Messengers, and there's, there's uh, uh, announcements about how they're building it and all the granite that's being brought in, and then it got washed out, and then it was rebuilt in the late 1800s. But this is a postcard. And... Um, it's, there's writing on the back of the postcard. Yeah, if you want to take a look at that. So when you, drive, when you drive past the Bradley Inn and you go straight, instead of turning left to the lighthouse, if you go straight and you come to the water, that's basically right where that dock is, straight. And then you take a 90 degree turn to the left. Tennis court. Yes. Yeah, that would be right here. Yeah. So this this is postcard, and I have to end the evening with uh, two two more slides. But I've got to read you the back of this postcard. Um, so uh, it's dated. Um, oh, I don't have the date of the postcard stamp. But anyway, it's it's around 1916, I guess. Around 1916. Pemmickwood Point, August 9th, 8.30 a.m. Dear M and all, 
Well, uh, yes, we uh, are here at last, but ye gods, we arrived at South Bristol in a pouring rain, which developed into a severe thunder shower. That little cockle shell boat from South Bristol to the point was like a toy boat in the trough of the boiling waves. <laughs> it rolled and pitched and tossed. I almost fell headlong, and we had to hang on to the thing to stay in our chairs. Yes, it was about the roughest passage I ever was to. I wasn't seasick at all, however. Um, I had no rubbers, though, and we had to paddle up to the hotel in the wettest downpour I ever knew. This is a picture of the float where we landed last night, drenched rats. Our, trun our trunks reposed on the little square float you see in the picture for two hours or more, and the Atlantic Ocean dashed over them. <laughs> Things in the bottom and top were wet but we hope no great damage was done then. The heat was intense until we boarded the boat at Damascot. My grandmother always said Damascot is the hottest place on earth. <laughs> anyway, they boarded the boat at Damascot, then we cooled down. We have our same cottage. And then after, after that description, she ends by saying, it is just as lovely as ever here. <laughs> and, yeah, that's right. <laughs> What's the date on that? 1916. And then uh, here's the road she paddled up oh, yeah. without her rubbers. Yeah. <laughs> to the, this is right in front of the hotel. Yeah. And here's a picture of the Pemaquid Hotel wow. in 1910. Wow. Yeah, so we made it. I'm sorry I kept you so late. Uh, <laughs> Look at our, please go home and, not, not tonight, but uh, go home and, and look at the archive and further explore some of these wonderful collections. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.